Life is like a puzzle. Now, I know what you're thinking. No, it's not. Life is like a box of chocolate. <laughs> now, go with me for a moment. Life is like a puzzle. I mean, a puzzle comes with hundreds, if not thousands of pieces, unless you're like me, playing with the little kids, and you like those six-piece puzzles that come with the really big wooden pieces. And those pieces are easy to put together when I have six to 12, but when I get a much more complicated puzzle that has hundreds, maybe thousands of pieces, it takes much longer to put a puzzle together. And sometimes it requires me to get the help of others to put a puzzle together, and life is just like that. Life is like a puzzle where you and I are trying to put the pieces of life together, hoping that we can figure everything out, no matter where we are, what's going on, that everything will just seamlessly come together. My father-in-law, I'm on loop, you guys. My father-in-law loves to do puzzles. And I mean all kinds of puzzles, the three-dimensional puzzles, the flat puzzles, whatever. He loves puzzles. And on one occasion, we happened to be at his house, and he was working on a puzzle. And it happened to take uh, the entire dining room table. And when he works on a puzzle, it's usually either days, weeks, or even months that he works on a puzzle. And we just happened to be there on this one occasion, and he had been working on a puzzle. I don't know how long he'd been working on it. And he was coming towards the end where the puzzle was almost complete, but there was a problem. A piece was missing. <laughs> Ugh. And I could see the frustration all over his face. And so he began to ask all of us to help him find that missing piece. And so what do you do? You first go to the box. Well, maybe it's in the box. And you rattle the box, and there's nothing in the box. And you open the box, there's still nothing in the box. And so then you get on the ground, and you start looking everywhere to find that one piece so that you can complete the puzzle. Life is a lot like a puzzle. To where it seems like you and I, it's sometimes we have missing pieces, no matter how hard we try to find it. To fill in that one piece, we just can't seem to find it. No matter where we look, no matter where we go, we just can't seem to find that one missing piece. Again, I think life is a lot like a puzzle. You and I trying to put things together, hoping that we can figure this thing out. And last week, we started a brand new series called Searching for Satisfaction, looking at a guy by the name of Solomon. And we believe, and some people believe, that Solomon wrote it, or at least whoever wrote it, wrote it on behalf of Solomon because it speaks of his life. And last week, we began to dive into the very first chapter of Ecclesiastes, and he said, life is meaningless. <laughs> it's meaningless. It's like a, a, a vapor. It's a, a mist, as Pastor Brett said. And I encourage you, if you didn't listen uh, or you weren't here, go back and check it out. It was a great message. And today we're going to continue on in Ecclesiastes and we're going to be in chapter 1 still looking at verses 12 through 18. And it's interesting to me that he goes from this idea of life being meaningless to this pursuit of, well, let me figure out what it is that I'm searching for. And the very first thing that we discover that it is that he is searching for is wisdom, which is interesting to me when it comes to Solomon. Because we know Solomon was supposed to be the wisest man. I mean, if you go back to 1 Kings, you see where he was granted this, you know, wish, I guess, in a sense of what is it, Solomon, that you want? Well, I want wisdom. And what we get twisted sometimes is the kind of wisdom that he was pursuing. Because early on, as a, as a young man, the wisdom that he wanted was wisdom that would come from God. God, you give me wisdom so that I can lead in a way that honors and glorifies you. But then somewhere along his life, it got lost in translation. And the wisdom became about personal pursuit, personal gain. It came about the things that he thought would fill the appetite of his heart, the desires of his heart. And so he began to pursue everything and anything at times other than God because he thought that it would fill the void that existed in his life. And so then he goes on this search of, well, what is wisdom and how do I begin to discover wisdom? And that's where we're going to find ourselves because, see, at the end of the day, I don't want you to miss this. Wisdom and knowledge will never, ever truly satisfy you. 
and it will be a search that you pursue the rest of your life hoping to fill whatever it is that you're looking for in life. So if you have your Bibles, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 12. In verse 12 it says, I the teacher was king over Israel and Jerusalem. I applied my mind to study and explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. What a heavy burden God has laid on mankind. I mean, here he is as he starts off in just verses 12 and 13 as he begins to look at, well, what is wisdom? He says, I've searched everywhere. I've looked under every rock. I've looked in every place possible to find wisdom and knowledge. And at the end of the day, all that I have found is meaningless. And then he says, what a heavy burden God has laid on mankind. Can we all agree on something today? Life is tough, but I believe it's a gift from God. Life is tough. I mean, all of us have been in hard spots in our life. And the same thing was true for Solomon. We've had situations or circumstances where we just throw our hands in the air and we say, why or how did I get here? Life is tough. And it's tough because of the decisions or the choices that we've made. It's tough. But at the end of the day, it's a gift from God, the life that you and I get to live, the air that we get to breathe, the fact that you and I woke up today and we get to be here and we get to worship. It's a blessing. But let's not mistake it. It's tough. It's tough. For some people, it's tough just to get up in the morning. For some, it's just tough to go to work. For some, it's tough because of the relationships that they have. For others, it's tough because I don't know God and I don't know what God wants for me. And for him, he was saying, look, life is tough. And no matter how hard I search and no matter how much I learn and to discover, it's never going to be enough. Life's tough. And what I know is that in the beginning when God created everything, when he created man in the garden before sin had entered into the picture, life was great. Life was amazing. But then sin entered and it changed everything. And from then on, everything has been groaning with agony and pain. How do I know that? Because Paul writes in Romans 8, chapter 22, he writes this, he says, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to this present time. We know that everything hurts. We know there's a pain that exists within all of us whether we're willing to admit it or not. Life is tough. Even when you put on the best game face possible. Life's hard. Life has unexpected bumps in the road that no matter how much we prepare, it could never prepare us enough. I mean, this is what Solomon's saying. He's saying wisdom. No matter how much knowledge or intellect or wisdom you have, it's never going to be enough. It's not going to provide all the answers that you need to life. But that's okay. Because that's okay for those that are in Christ. Those who have given their life to Jesus can trust that God's plan and his purpose is greater than what this world has to offer. Because the life that I live as a son of God continues well beyond this body or this world because of who he is and what he did on the cross. Life is tough, but I can face life because of what Jesus did for me. Life is tough. He took what I deserve by going to the cross, taking my penalty, my shame, my hurt, my pain. He took it on my behalf because of his love for me. Again, I know life is tough. And you're probably saying, why do you keep saying that? Because it's true. We've all had seasons, moments, situations, no matter how much we prepared plan and strategize something caught us off guard it knocked us off of our feet 
It threw us back in a way that we never expected. Not me, not now. I mean, it seems to be one thing after another. Can I just get a break? I feel that way sometimes when I talk to my mom. For those that have been around for a while, you know that my mom's had a struggle. She had cancer and she fought cancer and she overcame that. She had lung cancer, had one of her lungs removed. And then she overcame cancer and then she had a massive heart attack and had to have a quadruple bypass. And then this week I was talking to my mom on my what would have been my grandmother's 100th birthday on Friday, uh, just to check in with my mom to see how she was doing, and she informed me that she's having hip replacement surgery. And her response was this, which seems so normal to all of us. I just hope this is the last thing. Life's tough. I, I wished I had all the answers. I wish I could go to my mom and just swoop in and say, let me fix your problems. Let me solve all of this. But see, there was a hope in the middle of that when she said, I hope this is the last thing. But if it's not, God has a better plan. He has a better plan. And which is huge for my mom to be able to say something like that because I've always said that my mom is an Eeyore. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about if you watch Winnie the Pooh, right? But to see the other side of that, that no matter what trial or struggle that she was going through, no matter how tough it got, she wasn't going to give up because there was something more on the other side. That's what Solomon's saying. He's saying life, yes, it is meaningless at its essence. And whatever it is that you're trying to explore and discover, even if it's wisdom and knowledge and intellect, it will never be enough. That's why he says it's a heavy burden that God has laid on mankind. Look at what he says in verse 14. I've seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless. A chasing after the wind. <laughs> I've seen everything. I mean, that's a, I've got the t-shirt. I've done it. <laughs> I've been there. You're not telling me anything that I don't already know. I mean, that's what Solomon's saying. He's saying, there's no surprise that you can bring my way that I'm not prepared for. But it's all meaningless. And then he says, it's a, a chasing after the wind. Life doesn't get easier if you try to run from it. I mean, that's what, that's what he's saying. He's saying, life doesn't get easier if you try to run from it. I mean, how many of us have tried to run from a certain situation or circumstance in our life? Maybe it's a relationship. <sighs> that relationship is so far gone. I want nothing to do with that person. It can never be fixed. And so you run from it. Maybe it's, maybe it's a career. You're in a job and you feel like it's a dead end job. You hate it, but yet you know God is telling you to stay, but all you want to do is run. Or maybe there's a failure in your life that you feel will scar you or mark you for the rest of your life, and all you want to do is run because it's easier to run and hide than it is to face it. He says, life doesn't get easier if you run. It's like the chasing of the wind. So what is it that you're running from? I mean, because at some point in our life, we've all ran from something. Oh, it's just too hard to face. Man, the hurt, the pain, maybe the shame that I'll face if I meet this head on. Oh, it's just easier to run. I don't want to deal with that, that situation because it requires a difficult conversation. And I'm not ready for that. I, I don't know what it is that you're running from. But he's saying that wisdom, knowledge, isn't always going to fix your problems. So what are you running from? What are you, what are you running from that God says, hey, just, just face this head on. I, I've got you. I'm there. I'm with you. Maybe it's you're running from God. You know what? I, I can't face God today because if 
He knew what I've done or where I've been. He wouldn't forgive me. He's not going to love me. And that's the farthest thing from the truth. That is the biggest lie that you will ever believe. It's the lie that the enemy wants to plant within you and with me. That God could never love you the way that you are. God could never love you for what you've done. That is so wrong. And so what do we do? We run from God. I mean, this is Solomon later in his life who had done everything, tried everything. I mean, people came from all over looking to him for his wisdom and his knowledge, and they were astonished. I mean, they were blown away by the things that he knew and could do. But yet he found himself in a place. I've ran so far from God. I took this beautiful gift that he gave me and I began to use it in a totally different way to benefit my own selfish desire. I mean, he's saying we can't run. And then he goes on in verse 15, it says, what is crooked cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. He's ultimately saying to you and me that not everything can be changed. <laughs> That's interesting to me because by nature, I'm a fixer. If there's a problem, I want to fix it. So much so that I annoy my wife. Oh, honey, l- let me fix that problem. I don't need you to fix it. I just need you to listen. Whoa, I just want to help, right? Come on, we can change this. We can fix this. We can make it better. There's got to be something we can do. Not everything can be changed, no matter how hard we try. I mean, how many of us could look back over the course of our life and say, man, I, I wish I could change that. I, I wish I had never said that or done that. I wish I hadn't been there. Not everything can be changed. I mean, that's, that's what he's saying. He's saying there are some things in this world that you and I don't understand that we don't get that are crooked, that cannot be straightened. There are things that happen, relationships that get broken, and we're like, I just want to go back and fix it. And you can't. There's things that happen. I, I wish I could take cancer away from my mom, but I couldn't. I couldn't fix it. I couldn't change it. I wish I had a relationship with my dad, but I don't. I can't change that. I wish he would have been there as a young man growing up, giving me guidance and direction and hope. But I can't fix that. I, I, I can't change it. I mean, for some of us, we look to wisdom and knowledge to try to fix the problems that exist in our life. And even the problems in our world, things happen in our world and we sit back and say, only if. And there's certain things that we just can't change. And here's the reality behind that. Even if we could change it, And even if we could change God's mind and say, God, could you just fix this? Could you change this? And if he did, we still couldn't understand it. We still couldn't understand it. And it seems like that's the life that we try to live. I I just want to be better than this. I want to change this. I want to do this. I want to change this about me. I want to become this. I want to become that. And not everything can be changed. And he's telling us just to, hey, slow down. Slow down for just a moment. Where are you in this thing that you call life? And what is it that is beginning to to guide you? And what is it that you're ultimately searching for? Because at the end of the day, all of us are searching for something and hoping that whatever it is that we're trying to find can fill that void that exists in our lives. Sometimes we can't change it. Look at what he says in verse 16 through 18. I said to myself, look, I have increased in wisdom more than anyone else who has ruled over Jerusalem before me. I have experienced much of wisdom and knowledge. I mean, that's some boasting right there, isn't it? 
I mean, that's like the brag moment of, well, let me tell you how I'm better than you. <laughs> I mean, come on, we've all done it. Where you've been in a room of a group of people and somebody's telling you something about your, their life and you're just waiting to butt in to tell, but let me tell you about me. Let me tell you where I've been better. He's, he's bragging in a, in a sense of, look at me. I've got more wisdom. I've got more knowledge than anyone that's ruled before me. And then in verse 17, he says, Then I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and also of madness and folly. But I learned that this too is chasing after the wind. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. I mean, he starts off in this, hey, look at me moment. All of a sudden, he turns a 180 and it's like, it's not worth it. Everything that I've looked for, all that I've been searching for, everything that I've discovered, for I've got so much wisdom. With wisdom comes sorrow. And the more knowledge I gain, the more I learn, the more I discover, the more pain I have. Wisdom and experience will not solve every problem. I mean, that, that's what he's saying. Wisdom and experience won't solve every problem. Well, I've been there before. I've done that. Let me tell you how to fix it. Let me, ha let me tell you how to solve that problem. Or we find ourselves in, in another situation. Maybe it's a financial situation where we got out of debt. And the way that we approach that debt the first time to overcome that debt worked. But now we find ourselves back in debt again. Well, I'm just going to apply the same principles that I did before and hopefully it'll work. But the, the reality is, is you're a different person. It could be a totally different situation or circumstances that finds you in debt this time that you weren't in debt last time. And so wisdom and experience won't solve every problem. Again, he gives us this, this analogy of it's like chasing the wind. It's like I'm chasing after something. I'm pursuing something more. I just want to know more, discover more, become more. But it's not enough. No matter how hard I run after it, it's not enough. And the same thing comes true to, to faith for so many of us. We're searching and we're looking. Okay, God, I'm just running hard after you. I want to find you. I want to discover you. I want more of you. And for some of us, we're filling that emptiness or that void in our life with something else and hoping that it will satisfy. But it doesn't. And what he's beginning to unfold for us is this idea of faith. And what is faith? And what does faith begin to look like? Jesus begins to explain that to, to Thomas. Thomas, one of the disciples, and it was after the resurrection, and Thomas had found himself with the other disciples, and they said, hey, Thomas, you won't believe this. Jesus, he rose from the grave. Don't believe it. <laughs> There's nothing you can do or say that will change my mind. I don't believe it. The only way that I'm going to believe it is if I can experience it for myself. How many times have we said that? If I could just experience it for myself, wisdom and experience will help me to solve the problem that's in my life. It will help satisfy whatever emptiness exists. And that's what Thomas said. He says, there's, there's nothing you can say right now that will change my mind except for one thing. I want to see Jesus face to face. And I, I want to touch where the, the nails went in and the, the spear pierced his side. I'd like to touch it. And then Jesus has that reality moment with Thomas. And listen to what he says in John chapter 20. Verse 29, then Jesus told him, Thomas, I know it doesn't say it, but that's who he's referring to, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. <laughs> Wisdom and knowledge on its own is like chasing the wind. And so, if the rubber's gonna meet the road for your life and in mine, it all starts with faith. It all starts with us 
believing even if we can't see it. But wait a minute. It's easy to believe if I can see. Just, God, if you would just show up in this way, then I'll believe. God, if, if this miracle could happen, I would believe. God, if you could just change this situation or this circumstance in my life, I will believe. And he's saying it's faith. For those that don't see, that believe, that trust. So let me ask you this question. What is it that you're searching for? What are you searching for when it comes to life? Better marriage? Better relationship with your kids? Better friends? A better job? What is it that you're searching for? Bigger house? Nicer car? Better vacation? A bigger retirement? What is it that you're searching for? That you hope will begin to fill the void that exists in your life? Because what Solomon says is it's it's like chasing the wind. And all you're going to do is chase it and chase it. And it's always going to feel like it's just outside of your reach. Will you pray with me? Father, Lord God, we just come to, before you today and we say thank you. Thank you for allowing us to gather in this place and to worship. I mean, whether we're willing to admit it or not, we're all chasing something. We're all searching for something to bring us satisfaction. The corner office, a nice raise. Maybe it's just recognition, the pat on the back for all the hard work that we've done. I, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's the broken relationship. God, we're all searching for something. And today, God, I, I pray that you would just begin to reveal to us here in this time, in this place, as we continue our worship before you, that there is nothing in this world that will satisfy, no matter how hard we try. We can gain more knowledge, more wisdom. We can outpace everyone else and still feel empty. So we just ask you today, Lord, just fill the emptiness that exists within us. It's in Jesus' name that I pray, amen. Will you stand as we continue to worship?